The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. Shout for joy to God all the earth. Sing the glory of his name. Give to him glorious praise. Let us pray. Great and loving God, your will for us in Jesus is the peace which the world cannot give. 
your abiding gift is the advocate he promised. Calm all our troubled hearts. Dispel every fear. Keep us steadfast in love and faithful to your word as befits those in whom you have chosen to dwell. Grant this through Jesus Christ, the firstborn from the dead, who lives with you now and always in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God forever and ever. Amen. To those who are elect exiles of the dispersion, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father and the sanctification of the Spirit, for obedience to Jesus Christ and for sprinkling with his blood, may grace and peace be multiplied to you. The Lord be with you. Grace and peace to you this morning. Thank you for joining us here at worship at First Baptist Church of West Point. We are so thankful that you have chosen to, to celebrate the risen Lord with us as we continue through this Easter season. And we are even more thankful that though we are separated by distance, God's own spirit indwells within us and indwells within you. And we are more united in God than we can possibly imagine. And way more than we can perceive right now as we celebrate our risen Lord together. Hear now a reading from Psalm 66. We'll be reading verses 8 to 20. Listen carefully, this is God's word. Bless our God, O peoples. Let the sound of his praise be heard. He who has kept our soul among the living and has not let our feet slip. For you, O God, have tested us. You have tried us as silver is tried. You brought us into the net. You laid a crushing burden on our backs. You let men ride over our heads. We went through fire and through water, yet you have brought us out to a place of abundance. I will come into your house with burnt offerings. I will perform my vows to you. That which my lips uttered and my mouth promised when I was in trouble, I will offer to you burnt offerings of fattened animals with the smoke and of the sacrifice of rams. I will make an offering of bulls and goats. Come and hear, all you who fear God, and I will tell what he has done for my soul. I cried to him with my mouth, and high praise was on my tongue. If I had cherished iniquity in my heart, the Lord would not have listened, but truly God has listened. But truly God has listened. He has attended to the voice of my prayer. Blessed be God. Because he has not rejected my prayer or removed his steadfast love from me. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Here now our call to confession from Acts chapter 17. The times of ignorance God overlooked. But now he commands all people everywhere to repent. Because he has fixed on a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. Let us now turn to God and confess our sins to him, knowing that he is merciful and steadfast in his faithfulness to us. Let us pray first silently and then with a prayer of confession that I'll provide. Let us pray.
Almighty God, you have raised Jesus from death to life and crowned him as Lord of all. We do confess that we have not bowed before him, nor done what he has commanded us to do. We have gone along with the ways of the world and failed to love him as we ought. Forgive us, we pray. Through your promised Holy Spirit, raise us from sin and death that we may be your faithful people, lovingly doing the will of our Lord Jesus Christ, who rules the world and is head of the church, his body. Amen. Brothers and sisters, hear now the promise of God from John 14. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. In the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Alleluia. Amen. Say to God, how awesome are your deeds. Having confessed our sins and being assured of our forgiveness in Jesus Christ, let us commit by the power of the Holy Spirit to a life of obedience. Whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. We turn now to the reading of God's word. Our epistle lesson is from 1 Peter 3, 13 to 22. Listen again for God's word. Now who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them nor be troubled, but in your hearts honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but being made alive in the spirit, in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison because they formerly did not obey. When God's patience waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through water. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers having been subjected to him. And sisters and brothers, hear now the reading of the gospel. We're reading this morning from the gospel according to John, chapter 14. Verses 15 to 21. Again, listen carefully. This is God's word. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And I will ask of the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever. Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. 
yet you know him. For he dwells with you and will be with you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Yet a little while, and the world will see me no more, but you will see me. Because I live, you also live. In that day, you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. Whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. Let us pray. Gracious and almighty God, we confess our need of you. Because we do not hear as we ought, because we do not understand as we ought, We do not do as we ought. By your Holy Spirit and dwelling within us. Open up the scriptures to us. As these have been read. And as they echo in our hearts and in our minds. Transform us, O God. Not by our might not by our strength, and certainly not by our words, but by your eternal word that goes out from your spirit to proclaim the good news that Jesus Christ is risen from the dead and nothing on earth or under the earth or in heaven can separate us from the love of God In Jesus Christ. Amen. Our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ tells us, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. Kind of sounds like something our mothers might say, doesn't it? Having celebrated Mother's Day just last week, um, maybe some of us are still reflecting on our mothers Uh, The things that our mothers have taught us, the things that uh, our mothers um, said to us, the ways that our mothers have impacted us, especially the teachings that our mothers gave us on our lives. Um, The quality of the relationship between us and our mothers, of course, is key. For some, Mother's Day is actually a difficult reminder of a bad or, or even an abusive relationship. And then In those cases, it's probably fair to assume that a mother's instruction is not exactly taken in in high regard. The opposite is much more likely to be true for those who have had um, good relationships with their mothers. Uh, My mother and I had, and we still have, a good relationship despite a physical distance that separates us now. Of course, as the oldest child, um, as the people pleaser, the worst thing my mother could say to me wasn't um, said in times of anger. Um, It certainly wasn't, oh, you're grounded or you're in a lot of trouble. No, the worst thing that my mother could possibly say to me as the oldest people pleasing child growing up was, I'm disappointed. Relationships matter. There is a connection between the quality of the relationship and obedience. The people whom we obey, the ones from which we'll eagerly seek advice or counsel, those are often the same people to, which we, to whom we have close ties. And even though our mothers are, are still kind of on our minds this week, this is true for all of our relationships. Godly, human, parental Fathers, as a reminder, you get your turn next month. In fact, it's in answering a question about parenthood, about the Heavenly Father, that leads Jesus to speak these words from our passage for today. 
Uh, This section of John takes place on the night before Jesus' crucifixion. And John gives us a lengthy account of Jesus' teaching this night before his death. John puts it this way at the beginning of this section in chapter 13. When Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father. So in chapter 14... Jesus goes on preparing his disciples for his crucifixion and his death. He starts answering several of the disciples' comments or some of their questions and preparation for this departure. And a little bit before the passage that we've read this morning, Philip says um, in verse 8 of chapter 14, Lord, show us the Father and it is enough for us. Maybe not explicitly, but at least in some way, Philip senses that the answers to any kind of uncertainty about what to do do in the wake of of Jesus' departure are going to be made clearer through a better understanding of his relationship to God, his relationship to the Heavenly Father. Of course, Jesus is taken a bit back by this statement. Because it demonstrates a lack of understanding about Philip and Jesus' own relationship. That Philip, we've, we spent all this time together and you still don't know me? Jesus explains that to see Jesus is to see the Father. To look upon the face of Jesus is to look upon the face of God. And even after years spent eating together, sleeping on the ground next to each other, walking for miles, going from village to village, witnessing signs and miracles and healings, and receiving instruction from Jesus, Philip still doesn't completely understand who Jesus is, this fully God and fully human person standing in front of him. Jesus and the Father are one because Jesus and the Father are equally God. We can't blame Philip too much. We're really not that much better than him. To see Jesus is to see the Father. To obey Jesus is to obey the Father. But if we're honest with ourselves, we're really not very good about following even the simplest of the Father's commands. Our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ tells us, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. Sisters and brothers, we don't need to rush past this verse. Notice that Jesus does not say, If you love me, you ought to keep my commandments, though it certainly has that as part of its meaning. Um, Just like we do in English, we'll often use... The future tense to kind of carry forward the force of a command. Uh, This is what we mean, you know, when we say to our children, you will be back by 10 o'clock tonight. Certainly Jesus is giving a command to those who love him, but he's doing much more than that. He's talking about the quality of a relationship. He's talking about the quality of the relationship between him and those who claim to love him. He is talking about the very character of the person who loves him. When he repeats this instruction at the end of this passage in verse 21, he makes it even more explicit. Whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. Relationship and obedience are connected. Love and duty, they're not opposed to each other. Anyone who's ever been in a toxic relationship, whether that's a toxic relationship that's a romantic relationship or maybe with a boss or any kind of toxic relationship, you know that a claim to love while ignoring the person is not love. To claim to love someone and to ignore what they say is not love. 
And conversely, we know from history that, that simply doing one's duty, simply obeying what commands are given them, without any greater connection of love, leads to horror. Many of the people who perpetuated the true horrors of this world were quick to abandon love at the expense of doing their duty and being obedient. This is how the Holocaust happened. So looking at this verse, in verse 15, we have a question before us. Do we love God? Jesus. The pandemic has made it easy for some to avoid church, but you and I, I mean, we're here. We've, you've logged on to Facebook at, at 9.30 in the morning, or you're watching a recording of this on YouTube. Uh, surely that counts for something, right? Many of us have, have even given to the church in very difficult and very demanding financial times. Isn't that a demonstration of our love for Christ? We've strived very hard to truly love, love one another. To try to fulfill that new commandment that Jesus gives us earlier in this discourse that he gave his disciples earlier that Thursday night in John 13 to love one another. Friends, let us not soften this statement from Jesus. Let's not round off its edges. Let's not make it say something that it does not. Jesus does not say, if you love me, you should keep my commandments. Nor does, he, Lord, nor does our Lord say, if you love me, you'll do your very best to keep my commandments most of the time. No. Our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ, tells us, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Half measures and best efforts are not enough. And we don't need to look very far to see exactly how short we fall. In this pandemic and the ensuing economic downfall it's caused has gotten us all in a fervor over what must be done. And I'm neither an expert on disease transmission, I'm not an economist, and I'm not even going to begin to tell you with certainty the steps that we need to take to end the suffering we're all experiencing right now in myriad ways. And like everyone else, I have my opinions, but this is not my role as a preacher, and I'll point you, if you're looking for those kinds of things, to the experts in virology and sociology and economics who have studied these things and who know what to do much better than I do and there are plenty of wise rules and guidelines out there guidelines that God has given us truly by his common grace and more information on how to combat this calamity is present now than in any previous generation in human history. But this is my role. It is to remind you that your motivation in what you do matters. In taking any action or in not taking any action, why you do what you do is an indication about who and whose you are. Out of love we are to keep Jesus' commands. And Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, commands us to love one another too. And again, a quick look at the world around us shows us that we are divided against one another. It seems that any time an issue is brought before us, even this pandemic, we're quick to, to make sides and to pick sides, often centered around what to do next. And we make the mistake 
of thinking that there is one way to be right and another way to be wrong. And this betrays the reality of the situation that there are many, many, many ways to be wrong. And friends, rarely do we pick sides in any debate and start to demonstrate love toward one another. We see this in the extremes clearly, but it exists in between the extremes as well. Certainly it exists in our daily living. From cowering in fear out of a desire for self-preservation, which is not how you show love to one another, to just flaunting your freedom without any regard to the health and to the safety of others, which is also not how you show love for one another. So we see that whether it's hoarding toilet paper or yelling in a stranger's face or any number of things that we do in between, the driving motivation for any of our actions should be a love for Christ and our neighbor. And anything less than that is sin. We will face many difficult decisions over the next coming months and it will not always be clear what the right decision to make is but what must remain at the forefront of our decision making is the motivation for our decision making. Love. Love that flows from our relationship to Jesus Christ. So we ask, do we love Jesus? The answer, if we dare look at our ability to keep his commands especially our own ability to keep them on our own strength, we must say no. The harsh reality is that on our own, we do not begin to love Jesus as we ought to love him. But friends, it is in the midst of this sobering reality that we find true comfort. Sisters and brothers, for those of us who recognize our own brokenness and our own failure and our own sin, there is good news. Even when our faithfulness to God is lacking, God remains faithful to us. And even when we, by our own actions, demonstrate a hatred for God and a hatred for His Son, God shows His love for us. God loves us so much that God has chosen to dwell in us and among us. God gives us his own spirit. In the same breath that Jesus talks about the faithfulness of those who love him, Jesus demonstrates his own faithfulness by that promise of the Holy Spirit. Those whom God calls, God equips. For those of us who have been chosen by God to be his people, we can take heart that God does not require of us that which God himself does not provide. We are an Easter people. It is still the season of Easter by the church calendar, and more than that, uh, every time that we gather together on a Sunday, we are celebrating and we are remembering the resurrection of Jesus In a week, we'll celebrate this ascension of Jesus into heaven, remembering that he is the Lord of heaven and earth. And in a couple weeks, we'll get to celebrate Pentecost, uh, the day when the first disciples received the Holy Spirit in fullness, the very spirit of the living God that dwells within you and within me. This is the one whom Jesus promises in this passage. And while our flesh and while our desires for the things of this world, for the things that are selfish, continues within us, God still provides his own spirit that stirs up within us our longing and our love for Christ Jesus, the one whom the world cannot receive. He dwells with us and within us. (coughs) The same Lord who says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments, also says, I will not leave you as orphans. Our relationship with Jesus is not dependent 
on our feelings, just as Jesus' relationship with the disciples was not dependent on them physically seeing him. We are connected to Christ and are able to love Christ, to truly love Jesus because of the Spirit of God that is given to us. Because he lives, we also will live. And it doesn't matter what suffering the world might bring to us. And we are all suffering right now. And we are all praying that things will get better. Even that our lives will return to normal. Of course, the sober reality is, beloved, that there is no returning to normal after this. And even if the world around us returns to something even close to resembling normal, we will never be normal again. We cannot endure times like this and not be changed. But the good news for us today and always is that the one who changes not has dug his heels into us. We're not getting away from him. Jesus reassures his disciples time and again that his coming back to him, first through his resurrection and then through his coming again, He promises his disciples and us that we are connected to Jesus far more intimately than we could possibly dream or imagine. By the Spirit, we are in Christ as Christ is in the Father and as Christ is in us. These are the bonds between God and us which cannot be shaken by the things of this world, which cannot be shaken by a pandemic, which cannot be shaken by difficult finances, which cannot be shaken even by death itself. When you are suffering, hear the words of Jesus, I will not leave you as orphans. When you are wondering where God is, hear the words of Jesus, I will not leave you as orphans. When you question what God is doing, hear the words of Jesus, I will not leave you as orphans. When you doubt your ability to obey God, even when you doubt your own love for our Savior, hear the words of Jesus, I will not leave you as orphans. When you are facing difficult decisions in the midst of difficult times, hear the words of Jesus, I will not leave you as orphans. Look. Not to yourselves, but to the God who loved you so much, he did not spare his own son for your salvation. Look, not to yourselves, but to the Christ who loved you so much, he laid down his life that you might have everlasting and abundant life in him. Look not to yourselves, but to the Spirit of God, that same Holy Spirit who loved you so much, who loves you so much, he dwells within you, and that the dwelling place of God is now with human beings. And in that love, and that love that just mocks our ability to do anything by our own strength, obey the commands of Christ including the command to love one another. Truly, he will never leave us nor forsake us in this life nor in the life to come. To him be all glory and majesty and power and dominion forever and ever. Alleluia. Amen. to thank Sherrod for being with us this morning and sharing God's word. And as we respond to what God has said to us this morning, let's do so with the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, He was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, 
the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. I remind you that this morning, uh, following our service at 1030, there will be adult Sunday school via Zoom. So uh, you should have gotten a link from Deborah Downs, and you can participate in uh, this morning's Sunday school class at 1030 by following that link. I also remind you that our food closet is still open and uh, serving our community. So if you know of anyone in need, you can refer them to the food closet. It's open on Wednesdays from 9.30 a.m. to 12 noon. And uh, we, of course, appreciate your financial support of the food closet and also the Meals on Wheels program that is a part of that and that is still ongoing. Uh, we, we have uh, a lot of need right now, and uh, we appreciate your generosity in supporting those ministries. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our great and loving Father, we come before you this morning with thankful hearts. It is hard to imagine that we have been absent as the body of Christ from this place, worshiping one another for two months now, more than two months. And, and our hearts yearn for one another. They yearn to know the fellowship of the body of Christ together. Yeah, Father, we also know that in this time, one way that we, we love one another is through this separation. We know it cannot continue as such. And so we pray, Father, for, for healing, for deliverance from, from this virus. We also pray for wisdom, for strength and courage, for patience. As we move forward, give us, give us insight and guidance into how it is we are to both function as your people, as a witness in this community, as a body of believers that worship and glorify you and that edify one another. We ask, Father, for your continued care and mercy over Roger, strengthening his body. We pray for Jane in, in, in this time of separation from one another. We, we lift up Dot, and I ask for, for healing for her, that you would uh, strengthen her body, give her, give her appetite and uh, the ability to, to find nourishment in these days. Uh, we, we pray for, for Margie Terry's family. I ask that you would comfort them. And Father, we, we ask for our leaders, locally, state level, at a national level, for those who are in government and those who, who serve in the health care professions, we, we pray, Father, that you would give them consensus uh, in wisdom, Father. We ask that, that they might lead us as a people in a way that glorifies you, but in a way that is to our benefit as well. We ask that that you would continue to, to strengthen and sustain those who are serving in the healthcare profession, who, who are giving of themselves sacrificially and care for the sick. We, we ask for those who continue to, to serve in, in grocery stores and uh, in delivery services, that you would watch over them and protect them. And as we move back into to varying ways of life. We ask, Father, that we would do so with courtesy and respect for one another. And Father, for those who, who serve your body around the world in various ways, proclaiming Christ crucified, demonstrating your love for this world, we ask for boldness now, for boldness in proclamation and boldness in love Hear us now, Father, as we pray the words that our Lord has taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth 
as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Remember this word, brothers and sisters. Finally, all of you have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind. Do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, bless for to this you were called, that you may obtain a blessing. And now, peace to all of you who are in Christ. Amen. Go in peace.